Welcome everybody to DCR's parking meeting proposal meeting. Thank you for joining us. We're going to uh, uh, give it a couple minutes so folks can uh, get logged into the meeting. We'll be started in oh, about two or three minutes. Okay, it looks like the flow of people logging in is uh, slowed down a bit, so let's get started. Uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight for the second of two meetings on DCR's parking meter proposal. Um, next slide. Uh, before we get started, I want to go through a couple of kind of uh, meeting logistics. Uh, please note that this meeting will be recorded and the recording will be a public record. We're using the Zoom platform, so you'll have two ways to ask questions during the webinar. Uh, you can raise your hand in the participants panel, or you can use the Q&A feature. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A feature uh, to enter any questions you would like to have answered during the meeting. Uh, we like to leave chat for people to chat amongst themselves. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to submit comments over the course of the next two weeks at DCR's public comments page or via email to me, jennifer.norwood at mass.gov. Our last slide uh, will we'll put up all of these options as well. Next slide. On behalf of uh, Governor Baker, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Polito, EEA Secretary Thea Herides, and DCR Commissioner Montgomery, we welcome you all to our meeting tonight. Next slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of who's here with us, uh, from our partners at IPS Group, we have Mark Burling and Jim Cardiello. From DCR, we have uh, Stefan Skolinski from the Legislative Affairs Office, Jeff Prenti, who is our Deputy Chief Engineer, Mike Nelson and Adam Parr, our Chief Rangers. We have Jordan Braxton from the Parking Office, and Hazel Clarence from DCR's Parking Operations, uh, pardon me, DCR's Parking Operations Manager. Um, on another note, uh, we are uh, very pleased to have tonight uh, Revere Mayor Brian Arrigo, uh, Senator William Brownsberger, State Representative Rosalie Vincent, Boston City Councilor Kenzie Bach, and some other folks who are representing us from the City of Boston and Revere. We will give all of those folks a chance to speak at the beginning of Q&A. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Hazel. Hazel? Thank you, Jenny. Once again, my name is Hazel Clarence, and I will be walking you through the presentation today, um, this evening. Tonight's agenda includes welcome introduction, provide you with some information about the project background, give you a little information about the project scope and timeline where we are currently and where we are headed. As Jenny previously mentioned, you will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And lastly, we'll close by providing you with the next steps. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who are not aware of the fabulous things that DCR does, DCR manages state parks and oversees more than 450,000 acres throughout Massachusetts. It protects, promotes, and enhances the state's natural, cultural, and recreational services. Some of the areas that DCR manages includes Riviera Beach, it includes Carson Beach, and it also includes parts of the Appalachian Trail. Next slide. Um, the parking program will fall under the Ranger Division with the aim to imp implement parking strategies on DCR roadways that are consistent with host municipalities. In this case, our host municipalities includes areas in which DCR operates, so Boston, Cambridge, Revere, and Watertown. The overall goal is to generate revenue that 
will aim in all aspects of DCR's mission by supporting its staff, materials, and programs without putting additional strain on the Commonwealth's overall budget. Next slide. For, for DCR's um, philosophy, we wanted three elements that really speaks to our goals and where we're headed. So one of the main, um, one of the three elements that we'd selected was economic stability, environmentally friendly, and customer centric. From an economic stability standpoint, the system has to be self-sustaining. So we want it to be um, at least revenue neutral and at positive, um, at most revenue positive. From an environmentally stand standpoint, we wanted the parking technology that we utilize to have a green component. And then lastly, and most importantly, from a customer-centric standpoint, the program must be equitable and also accessible for our diverse community. Next slide, please. So the main reason why many of you are here tonight is to find out exactly why DCR has decided to implement a parking, um, an on-street parking program. First of all, DCR um, wants to be able to fund its park operations. As previously mentioned, DCR has an extensive infrastructure, an extensive array of um, areas in which it manages from rail from roadways to state parks to dams etc dcr pretty much does it all when it ter in terms of environmental and recreational services so um, in order for us to continue to provide an environment that is clean and safe for our constituency um, additional funding is definitely is pretty much required at this particular at this particular point we also want to be able to dis, um, discourage vehicle storage uh, there are tons of vehicles on DCR roadways that sometimes last days or um, months without moving so by implementing a paid parking program it will discourage people from just staying on our roadways and will also provide uh, more space and more um, more spaces for our visitors. And lastly, by implementing a parking program that utilizes smart technology, we will be able to make a better decision moving forward using data. We'll be able to tailor the data based on both our um, constituents and DCR's needs. Next slide, please. So the parking program is something that we just we just didn't decide decide to implement. It has been in the works for several, year, for several years. So back in 2014, um, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government conducted a revenue study on, the, on behalf of DCR exclusively in Boston and Cambridge. It looked at all of DCR's roadways and categorized it based on whether they were restricted and unrestricted. This analysis used DCR existing rate structure of providing parking at $1.25 an hour. This $1.25 an hour represents rates that are comparable to or less than the rates charged at our host municipalities. And take it into account the way in which DCR um, will implement the paid parking program. The analysis looked at both single space meters versus multiple space meters. For those who currently have an annual parking pass, this program is not will not be valid. Next slide, please. So the overall scope is to implement a curbside revenue. Um, collection program by using parking meters for Boston, Cambridge, Revere, and Watertown. For Boston, the, the Fenway, Park Drive, and Cambridge East was selected to participate in the year-round program. Um, this is only for unre unregulated space or spaces that are currently free. Any area that is designated as resident parking only, it does not apply to in Cambridge Memorial Drive and Cambridge Parkway were also, um, were also selected for a year-round program as with Deltry Pool in Watertown. Lastly, Revere Beach um, was selected for a seasonal program with the season starting April 15th to October 15th. Overall, the rate structure for these areas will be $1.25 an hour and the hours of operation for Boston, Cambridge and Revere will be from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
Monday to Monday to Saturdays, and for Watertown, it will be 9 a.m. to 5 um, p.m. Monday through Saturdays. Holidays and Sundays are not included. So collectively, the overall space associated with these locations are um, 1,700. Next slide, please. Uh, this chart gives you an overall, overall idea of the rates um, of our host municipalities compared to DCR rates. As you can see, Boston, which is a tiered um, rate system, um, their rates are at a premium to those of DCRs. Cambridge, which also has a rate structure, is more comparable to the rate that DCR charges. And for Revere, um, which recently implemented an on-street parking program, their rates are less than um, DCR rates. However, looking at it in its totality, totality, we still feel that our rates are equitable. As I previously mentioned, we definitely wanted to provide a program that is equitable and accessible to all of our constituency. So we feel that um, the 125 rates, which is based on our legislative um, regulations, are equ is equitable. Next slide. So for implementing the parking program, DCR looked into single space meters versus multiple space meters. After conducting the assessment, DCR realized that multiple space meters was the best option for the agency. First off, in terms of single space meters, more people are using parking apps, so single space meters are seeing less use. From an aesthetic standpoint, DCR felt that multiple space meters was the best option, as multiple space meters covers um, up to 10 spaces, which means that we require less hardware for DCR's historical um, parkways. In terms of the costs associated with running the program, the maintenance, collections, communication fees, and licensing fees was much less in a multiple space environment than that of a single space meter. Um, single space meters. So when we're looking at the overall cost in terms of the installation and also in terms of purchasing, um, multiple space meters came up ahead than single space meters. Next slide. So as previously mentioned, um, the areas in which we will implement um, parking meters, there will be a set number of meters in each area. For Boston in the Fenway area, we propose to install 14 meters. On Park Drive, we also we will propose to um, install 23 meters to cover a total of 231 spaces. For Cambridge East um, at Boylston and Cambridge East at Newbury, with a total of 32 spaces, we will install um, three meters in that particular area. In Cambridge and Memorial Drive, we will install 18 meters. In Park Drive, we will st install nine meters. And for Revere Beach, we intend to install um, roughly 100 meters to cover a total of 1,075 spaces. As you can see, um, Cambridge, um, excuse me, Revere represents the majority of our portfolio. And lastly, for Deltry Pool in Watertown, we will install one meter. Next slide, please. I will now turn it over to Mark Berlin from IPS to discuss um, the meter in which we intend to install. Thank you, Hazel. Um, the meters are solar powered. They have a uh, solar panel on the back, on the front sloping down or on the top, and then on the front uh, of the meter allowing us to maximize solar gain and uh, provide optimal power efficiency. Uh, the meter itself, we have both um, a single space meter, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, that has four buttons on it for navigation, and we brought those same buttons to our pay station. There's a plus, minus, okay, and cancel button that makes it very familiar to anybody that's been in Revere or Boston or uh, many other of our customers, including Arlington, Cambridge, Lynn, Malden, Newton, uh, Somerville, and soon to be Watertown. Um, the meters accept coins and credit cards and you complete the transaction by entering your plate number. We also support uh, pay by phone. And there are multiple languages that we can program into the meter. Next slide, please. So the meter has a LED light on the top. So when any button is pressed, 
those lights shine down, allowing you to see all the keys and the uh, display screen uh, illuminates as well to make it very easy to complete that transaction. The unit is made out of stainless steel. So in our environment where we have snow and salt and in Revere Beach where you have sand and salt and um, you know, humidity, a lot of moisture, the unit will not rust and it will stand up uh, to the elements. Next slide, please. So here's an example of uh, our unit um, in the night. And um, as I mentioned, you know, when we're uh, heading towards December 21st, where it gets dark around 4.30, you'll still be able to make your transactions and complete your payments um, through the enforcement hours of 8 p.m. Uh, with this meter. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, just on a separate note to add to, um, to what Mark has said, in a multiple space um, environment using pay by plate, we recommend that our customers take a picture of their license plate so that they can enter the correct information into the meters. Um, we will have a component, uh, enforcement component, which I will discuss um, a little bit later on in this presentation. So in order for customers to, uh, to avoid citations, we definitely recommend entering their license plate correctly. So we, um, in terms of our mobile payment, we are planning to offer multiple payment op uh, applications, in particular Passport and the, the Park mobile apps. So customers who have parked in Boston and parked in Chelsea are already familiar with this app, so it goes along with our con providing a consistent experience to our parkers. Some of the benefits of mobile payment is that it's contactless. You have a virtual meter at the palm of your hand where you could receive alerts informing you that your time is running out. You could pay, pay remotely, and also you could pay with a various payment method, whether through credit cards, debit cards, or some um, form of PayPal. Additionally, it serves as a receipt depository where you could keep all your receipts and later on check to see where you spent the most time. Next slide. The next few slides will give you a visual representation of where we plan to install the meters. The red icons are DCR meters and the blue icons are our host municipality meters. So as you can see, Boston has meters um, throughout the Fenway area and into some of them meters pretty much intersects with DCR's um, roadways. So we plan to install meters starting at Lewis Pasteur, um, heading towards Simmons College, uh, the back of the Museum of Fine Arts and also heading towards Bo on Boylston Street. As previously mentioned, we will um, install roughly 14 meters in this area. For Park Drive, meters will be installed starting at Petersboro Street, heading towards um, the Back Bay Fence and ending at um, Boylston, the beacon side of Park Drive. Once again, we plan to install roughly 23 meters in this area. Um, in terms of the residential parking in this area, we will not install meters on the residence side. We will only install meters in the unregulated side or uh, the side that is currently free. Next slide, please. For Cambridge East, um, meters will be installed starting at um, Charlesgate East and Boylston, heading towards um, Charlesgate and Ip Ipswich. Once again, um, Boston meters are um, installed along the I Ipswich area. For Charlesgate East and Newbury, we plan to install one meter. Next slide. For Cambridge Parkway, um, meters will be installed um, from one end of Edwin Land Boulevard to the other end of Edwin Land Boulevard. This area is pretty simple. We're just planning to install roughly um, 18 meter, 18 or excuse me, nine meters in this area. Next slide. For Memorial Drive, meters will be installed starting at Longfellow Bridge or the One Memorial and heading towards um, Fowler Street on one, one excuse me, Memorial Drive. Meters will be installed on the MIT side. We're not planning to install meters on the um, excuse me, the Charles River side of one Memorial Drive. Next slide. 
Cambridge, excuse me, Riviera Beach, this picture may seem a little bit jar jarring, but keep in mind that this map is not drawn to size, and also that uh, Riviera Beach is roughly three miles long, or roughly 14,000 feet. So the meters are clustered on this map. Um, it, of course, it will be evenly spread out, so it doesn't seem all-consuming, and we intend to install uh, meters starting from Elliott Circle heading towards Cary Circle. Meters will be installed on both sides of the, of the boulevard. Next slide. And lastly, for Watertown, we will install one meter, uh, most likely at the entrance of Del Tree Pool. Next slide, please. Okay. Some of the areas that we have discussed have a residential component including Park Drive and Cambridge East. For these areas, um, anywhere a, a resident parking only sign is installed, we will not install meters in those areas. So although um, this program may seem that we're doing a lot, but technically um, for the residential side, it, there will be minor, cha minor changes. So on the overnight, in terms of the overnight residential parking, we will provide um, residents with four hour, additional hours of parking. So um, the overnight parking will change from 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. to 8, p 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Anywhere that is currently um, no over, excuse me, anywhere where overnight parking is allowed, we will not collect revenue fees. So once the meter shuts off at 8 p.m., um, people can continue to park as they normally would. Next, next um, slide, please. We've made some slight changes to Revere Beach. Right now, there is a parking ban from 8 a.m. through, excuse me, from 9 a.m. through 10 p.m. So we propose lifting this ban. We also propose lifting the four-hour parking limit. So once the meters are installed and up and running, um, the hours of operations will be from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. There will be no time limit at this particular point. There is also an existing um, par parking ban after 10 p.m. This particular parking ban will still be in effect. So from 8 p.m. to 8 a, um, 10 p.m., there will be um, the park. The meters will not be operational. So therefore, it will be free parking for all. Next slide, please. And one of the critical components of developing a parking program is the enforcement element. We are taking a non-punitive approach to um, enforcement where we are not, where our enforcement officers will not have a quota. Our enforcement officers, which as previously mentioned, will be part of the um, Ranger Division, will serve to uphold our current parking um, parking regulations. They will enforce the non-payment and they'll also enforce residential parking so that non-residents do not take over residential parking spaces, which are we all know are very val valuable. Additionally, um, our enforcement officers will assist customers with questions relating to media uses and also just general questions about the area. The hours of operations for an enforcement team will mirror that of the meter operations. So once again, for Boston, Cambridge, and Riviera, the hours of operation will be from 8 uh, a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturdays. And in Watertown, the hours of operation will be from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Holidays and Sundays, once again, will be for free. Next slide. So to give you a general idea of the project timeline as a whole, um, in 2014, the Harvard study was conducted where they determined that DCR should implement a paid parking program. In 2018, DCR um, conducted its own analysis based on the Harvard study and decided to add a couple of locations to the Harvard, um, to the parking program, such as Riviera and, and Watertown. 2019, DCR um, contacted several of the municipalities to get them a good idea of how it could structure its parking program. And in 2020, we are currently in our public outreach and planning phase. So right now, we will um, conduct site visits at each of the locations to get a good idea of whether or not um, 
to get a good idea of the number of meters that we will install and the exact location of the meters. So in the next few weeks, you will see DCR representative um, walking around. Please stop, please stop by, ask any questions. Um, we'll be more than help, um, willing to answer. And 2021 is our goal year. This is the year that we will install the meters and um, most likely the weather dependent, the meters will be installed from March through or um, April. And our actual goal live date, once again, weather permitting, will be May 2021. Next slide, please. So as part of our process, we will have a communication and outreach plan. Um, this is one of the last of two virtual meetings. Our presentations will be av available online. Um, uh, we will also provide communications through social media and press release prior to installation and activation. During this entire process, DCR will definitely have a robust communication system so that um, any questions that the community may have, they can um, pose it to us, whether through our website or um, through social media. Additionally, we do plan to um, create a web, web page on DCR's website informing people on parking regulations and also locations of, park, of the parking. Um, and lastly, we, plan, we do intend to um, utilize the mass.parks at mass.gov website. So any questions that the community may have, please forward it on to, the, to that website. Next slide. And lastly, if there are any questions, once again, if you need additional information, this will be available on um, the website provided in this presentation. And you also have a two-week period to submit any questions or comments um, to the public comment website. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, now we're going to start the Q&A, but before we start that, um, we'd like to invite uh, some of our legislators who have joined us tonight to speak. Um, so Senator Brownsberger, I'm going to unmute. You are, you are unmuted. You can go ahead and speak. Hi, um, this is, this is Alicia from, uh, Senator Will Brownsberger's office, um, at, I, the senator might also be um, on the line. Um, he was on last night. I um, uh, just wanted to, uh, uh, we appreciate the, the presentation um, and just uh, wanted to reiterate um, our, our opposition. Um, uh, the senator's been in communication with DCR, um, but our opposition to the proposal um, to, the, to the Fenway meters. Um, so I, I appreciate uh, the time, time um, and opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, now we have Representative uh, Rosalie Vincent. You should be able to speak, Representative Vincent. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, once again, I just want to say thank you. I know that I spoke uh, yesterday, but I just want to um, also express my, um, my real opposition to the um, meter program, the way it's currently being proposed on Revere Beach Boulevard. Um, I really think that it's unfathomable and really unjust that the revenues that are going to be generated from uh, the parking meters are not going to go into uh, America's first public beach, which is also a gateway city. Um, there's no more um, needy district um, that could use that money uh, to maintain our um, beach between the um, infrastructure that's that's having major issues from crumbling walls to um, our historic um, pavilions, which are in total disrepair. So I just want to once again state that I find it very, very upsetting because that wasn't what, as, as the chair of the Beaches Commission, that wasn't what I had um, heard throughout the talks that, that the monies that were generated would not go to the communities um, which they represent. So again, I just want to say I'm very um, concerned about the revenue factor of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Now we're going to invite uh, Mayor Brian Arrigo from Revere to speak. 
Go ahead, Mayor. Mayor Arrigo. Okay, looks like we're having some trouble there. Mayor, uh, why don't you text me um, when you're ready to speak? Okay, we are going to move on to, we have a couple of hands raised um, and uh, quite a few uh, written questions. I'm gonna start with the written questions. Um, the first two, uh, a clarifying question for the Fenway area. This only affects the two hour parking spots and not the hundreds of spots on Park Drive and the Fenway? Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I may need clarif quick clarification on that question. Um, hey, uh, unless Hazel, do you, does that, are you able to, to answer that? I think oh, it's based, sure. go ahead. Well, go ahead. in terms of Park Drive, we, um, as previously mentioned, we are only installing parking um, meters on the areas that are currently free. So um, the areas where there's a sign that says like, um, excuse me, resident parking after I believe, um, what's it, 10 o'clock? That's where we're, that's where we're um, installing parking meters. So we're not um, installing parking meters anywhere where there's a resident only parking sign. Okay, um, thank you. Next question. Um, for the Fenway, uh, these will be 24 hour meters or will they have time limits and residents would be able to park in these spots after time expires? Yes, I, I can answer that. So, so the hours of operation for the meters will be 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for all, for all meters and in all municipalities. Um, and so that after those hours, in the areas that are resident parking overnight, those would still be resident parking. So the, so the overnight hours for resident parking on those areas that have currently free parking and then resident parking overnight. Uh, currently, the overnight parking is 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. It would become resident parking now 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And the rest of the day would be metered. Um, there's no time limit on the meters. You could uh, park for an entire day at $1.25 per hour or, or I guess $15 for an entire day. Um, so, but there is no time limit and uh, in the meters are operational 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you. Um, okay, hold on. We have now um, Lauren, I'm looking up your name, Lauren Brody from uh, uh, City Councilor Kenzie Box Office uh, would like to speak. Go ahead, Lauren. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Lauren Brody. I'm here on behalf of City Councilor Kenzie Bach. Uh, the councilor spoke last night and she would like to reiterate her strong opposition to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Now I'm gonna go to some of the hands that are raised. Uh, okay, I've got um, Eric Lampendecchio. Okay, come on, it's not letting me let you speak. Hold on one second. Let me look you up, Larry, Eric. Shoot, I'm having a problem with that. I'm gonna go to some of the written questions until I figure that out. Uh, hold on, hand uh, raisers. Um, next question, I live on Revere Beach Boulevard. Will there be any kind of permit parking for residents or will we have to pay to park in front of our own homes? Um, so the current proposal is that um, from all the way from Elliott Circle up to Cary Circle on both sides, it will be um, pay to park um, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So um, DCR does not have a, a resident permit parking program. Um, and, and currently the regulations that would need to be some other mechanism to support um, a, a resident parking sticker uh, program within along the boulevard on, on the DCR property in Revere. Uh, so as of right now, no, there is no uh, plan for resident parking uh, sticker program uh, on, res on Revere Reach Boulevard. 
Okay, I, thank you, Mike. Um, I've figured this out. Eric Lampendecchio, you should be able to speak. Go Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I hope all of you and your families are doing well during these um, uncertain times. I just wanted to go on record as vehemently opposed to this project and its current format. Um, Revere Beach is America's first public beach. And, you know, it, it makes my insides turn a little bit when I hear that we're going to start charging folks to enjoy that. Um, I have some real concerns for the residents of Revere Beach, specifically those living northbound of Revere Street intersection, um, where the last resident said it perfectly, you know, you're going to start charging them to pay, you know, they have to pay to park in front of their own home. And that's just unreasonable in my opinion. So I would encourage DCR to go back to the drawing board and collaborate with the city of Revere and come up with a better plan for Revere residents. I also have some concerns for the residents in the Point of Pines. If we're going to start charging people to park on Revere Beach, they're going to start looking for free alternatives in the neighborhood. And I have some real concerns that they're going to start parking in the Point of Pines and overwhelming the residents that are already strained for parking in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Next, we have uh, Brian Clegg. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you very much. I, I have questions, actually. So the first set of questions is for the planners. And I want to know if the planners looked at what DCR has done in, in the East Fens in particular. I'm talking about the Fenway between the MFA, but most specifically between Westland Avenue on the Fenway up to Boylston Street. So, and also the DCR controls some land along Boylston Street. So the DCR has taken a lot of that parking and just given it, they've taken that parking away from tax paying residents and we do pay taxes. Somebody raised that issue yesterday. But we all pay excise taxes on our cars here in Boston. But um, somebody, you know, we're, and we also pay property taxes, but people took, the DCR took that parking away and gave it to Berkeley College of Music, which is a tax-free institution, and also to the Mass Historical Society and also to a church. But to all these tax-free institutions um, and, and uh, for their personal use. So the church only has a service once or twice a week, but they get use of that all all week long and nobody else can park there. And the DCR did that. So my question to the planners is, did you in fact look at the history of DCR's removal of parking for residents when you put this plan into place? That's one question for the planners. The second question um, is for the legislative expert who's here. Um, I support the DCR. If you're going to try to make money off of this, I think it's completely unfair to the DCR that you're charging a dollar and a quarter per hour during ball game parking when the man who owns the gas station over there can charge 90 bucks a game. Uh, that's not fair to the DCR. And so I want to know what folks like me, if you're going to persist in this program, at least you should make some money on it. And so what can folks like me who care about the DCR do to promote legislative change in order for DCR to get a fair rate on, on those meters um, during ball games because it's just not cricket that people can um, park there for a buck and a quarter an hour. Uh, my, my last thing that I want to say is a comment which is that I still think that people need to look especially at areas like the Fenway that are, that are squeezed from every possible direction by very powerful nonprofit educational and cultural institutions. Um, and, and you need to look at the history uh, of the way parking has been removed for us. So in my household, we're both working people. We work in places that are not serviced by the T. We've owned our home for 35 years and we're in danger of losing our homes because we can't afford to pay 350 bucks a car to park. That's, that's the way it is. Working people need cars, and this program for the East fans is just one more way to try to push working people out of the city so that only people who are extremely wealthy can afford to live here. Thank you very much for letting me speak. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mike, is there any way for us to answer some of the questions he had? Yeah, thanks, 
for the comments, I, I guess I can only say that we were that we were only looking at areas that were currently not regulated, so areas that were currently designated as free general public parking. So um, any of those regulated areas that that you referenced um, were were not part of what we were looking at on this. Um, so um, well, that's incomplete planning, if I might. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we've managed to uh, uh, reconnect uh, Mayor Arrigo. Ma Mayor, are you there? Mayor? Hmm. I'm going to try one more way to do this. Mayor, are you there? I don't know what the problem is. I got to keep working on it. Um, okay, next hand raised. We have, shoot, Stephen Wolf. Let me find, oh, there he is. Go ahead, Stephen. Stephen? Can you hear me now? Yes. So two, two, one, one sort of clarification and a question. The clarification is I, I live in the West Bends um, and that's right on Park Drive. Um, you are talking about installing the meters from Peterborough Street up to, I don't, can't recall actually the endpoint, but I assume it's Audubon Circle. Um, the Peterborough Street has two intersections with Park Drive. There's one on the east, across from the Victory Gardens. There's one on the west that faces the Emanuel Campus across the Muddy River. Am I correct in assuming that you're talking about starting at the western end of Peterborough Street? Or are you talking about the eastern end of Peterborough Street, which would basically have you adding new parking spaces, because there is no parking outside, outside of the carriage way, way along Park Drive. So where does the parking start? Which end of Peterborough Street does the parking zone begin? Yeah, so that that would be the that would be the entire stretch. So starting from uh, the east end of Peterborough Street, so which includes the area that has a combination of resident parking and public parking uh, daytime. Um, from there, is that is that right? That so means? so, but but am I correct in understanding that the carriageway, the parallel road on the inside of Park Drive, is not subject to this? Correct. We're not adding any new parking areas. So that, that was one clarification. So, so my, two, my question in pursuant to that is, you listed as one of your three goals, environmental friendliness. And, and I understand, I, I, I will step back and say, I've been on the board of a friends group that worked with the DCR very closely. I understand you guys have always been the stepchild of, of state budgeting. You never have enough money the last I heard, there was an $800 million backlog of, of maintenance that needed to be done. I don't know if that's gotten bigger or smaller, but it certainly wouldn't have gotten a lot smaller. The, the, but to go back to your goals that uh, Hazel was talking about, it, I, I don't understand how it's environmentally friendly to introduce however many new spaces you are putting onto Park Drive that don't exist there now. There's no parking from the eastern end of Peterborough Street up to roughly 203, 203 Park Drive by the, the Greek, the Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral. I don't know I got the name garbled, but the, the church up there. Um, and uh, so I, I don't fully see how this, how it's environmentally friendly to encourage more parking which as we know, induces more driving. So if you're really seeing that as part of your mission, my argument would be, we don't need more parking. We, we don't need new parking. 
we probably need better management of the parking that exists. Okay. So that, that doesn't have a yes or no answer. Um, that is really, I, I, I'm just trying to get a sense, just as I don't understand from this presentation, all of the language that makes it pretty clear that you folks plan to go ahead with this regardless of the community feedback. Um, everything was about, you know, we're starting, we go live in May, you'll see inspectors in the next month. That, that all suggests to me that you're going ahead regardless of what you hear. Why are we even, why am I even spending this time with you folks as informative and charming as you are and helpful as you are? What's the point of this meeting if we can't change your decision? So those are my, those are really kind of hybrid question comments. I don't see what the environmental Benefit, I only see environmental degradation from increase, from adding parking in Boston. And I don't understand what the point of this outreach effort is if in fact you guys already, already have a plan for doing this and it's really just you kind of going through the motions of letting us have our say. Sure, I think I, I, think I can kind of answer both parts of that. I'll take the, the second part first. Um, this, we do have a, a plan and and we and we even discussed internally we are, is this plan or proposal because it's kind of somewhere in between it's we have a plan but the details of the plan are still up for discussion internally externally and taking input from every direction um, we have not had a single conversation about this I, I keep saying as we have meetings about this um, daily that we have not had a single conversation about this where something doesn't change in, in our plan proposal um, so the, the, the details of how we're going to implement this are certainly still up for discussion and, and that is what these public meetings are about is taking that input and uh, last night's meeting was very informative and, and helpful and is as tonight's it has been as well and will be uh, as we take the rest of these comments. Um, as to the, the other part about environmental friendliness, um, the, the meters first off are, are solar powered. We're not plugging into any uh, power grid. And also we are not adding uh, any parking spaces uh, whatsoever throughout this program. Uh, this is just the existing parking uh, that will be metered. So if anything, that would be a deterrent, I suppose, to, to, more, uh, to more parking or more vehicles coming on the, onto the properties um, in certainly shorter stays. So more people being able to uh, theoretically enjoy the properties as there's more turnover, uh, as there's more incentive for people to not stay for an entire day uh, and things like that. So. Um, so I guess that, that would be my answer to, to your question about the, uh, the environmental piece as well. Okay, uh, next question. Why not extend the hours on revenue, on revenue, on uh, Revere Beach to 10 p.m. to co coincide with the current quiet zone restrictions? Really that was just for consistency and really trying not to create confusion by having a, a different hours in one community as opposed to another community um, so that people know that if you're going to be on a DCR, um, at a DCR parking meter on a DCR roadway, the hours are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. regardless of, of where you are in the, in the system. Okay, next question. Um, how will DCR be assisting Revere in the Point of Pines neighborhood as people look to park in the neighborhood to avoid paying? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question and actually that's a, a piece that just came up in conversation very recently. Um, thank you for the question is all I can say to that is that, that uh, this, this is a new thing that has been flagged for us and we're going to, uh, to include that in our planning going forward. Okay, next question. Is DCR willing to work with Revere to allow Revere residents to park overnight on the DCR or beach side of Revere Beach Boulevard? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one, Jenny? Uh, parking overnight in Revere, on Revere Beach Boulevard. Would we be willing to work with the city to um, allow Revere residents to park overnight? Um, that, had, again, so far in this conversation, it has been to not change any of the regulation, the, the currently regulated areas. Um, we can certainly take that back and discuss that, but as of right now, our plan is to only um, meter and, and to change nothing except that we're charging for the, uh, the, the public hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
Okay, I'm going to go uh, to another uh, hand raise. Let me get back over there. Okay, we're going to try Mayor Arrigo one more time. Mayor Arrigo, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> it worked. Yay. Yes, please go <laughs> ahead. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having these, uh, these informative meetings. Um, I, I know you've, you all received my, my letter, but I just wanted to express um, a few uh, concerns and, and um, open up the conversation. Uh, I'd say overall that uh, the city uh, would support a cooperative and collaborative effort between uh, DCR and the city. Uh, that provides a, a mutual benefit uh, to both parties when it comes to parking. Uh, while Revere Beach um, and the reservation is a source of immense pride for the city of Revere, uh, it also does create a, a set of unique challenges. Uh, we get a lot of visitors uh, to the city of Revere. Uh, we get a lot of traffic uh, that affects all of Revere, uh, not just the beach area. And uh, with the proximity to MBTA stations, uh, we have additional traffic and parking issues. Uh, Revere's objective uh, is always to work in concert with the state and with DCR. And under the leadership of Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, uh, and in coordination with DCR, um, and especially over the last uh, few years, we've enjoyed uh, quite a prosperous relationship uh, the, between the modernization uh, and the development along Revere Beach. Um, it has made um, the beach once again a destination uh, and now a new home for a new generation. Uh, the most visible example of the partnership between the city and DCR uh, is a beautiful new maintenance facility and the bathhouse that was opened uh, earlier uh, this year on the boulevard. A cleaner, safe, welcoming Revere Beach uh, is certainly an asset to all of the greater Boston area. Uh, and But we know and we appreciate that uh, it is not an easy task for DCR to carry uh, that out uh, on its own. So as you are considering the parking proposal, um, and it's a proposal that was advocated for by the city, uh, a similar proposal was advocated for by the city uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, so as you're considering this, we, we do implore you uh, to consider how Revere Beach is distinct from the other DCR properties where you're proposing uh, new parking requirements. Uh, as you all know, Revere, uh, Revere Beach is miles of reservation uh, lined uh, at various sections with commercial property, uh, multi-family residential building, uh, single family residential homes, and um, of course, beautiful recreational space. It's three miles uh, of beauty, business, and history. It has no definitive entrance uh, and is open and accessible, which is great sometimes and sometimes not that great, uh, through Revere's streets um, and off of uh, public transportation. And uh, from our opinion, from my opinion, um, we can't talk about Revere Beach Boulevard without considering uh, the parallel roadway of Ocean Avenue. Uh, the beach, the miles of roadway, uh, the acres of recreational, re recreational space uh, we know impose extraordinary and unusual demands on DCR and on the city. Uh, and so we envision revenue generated by parking meters as a valuable source of funds to address uh, the vital and, and the many capital projects that Revere Beach needs. Uh, and I know uh, Representative Rosalie Vincent pointed this out last, last night. Um, that this is a great opportunity to address long ignored projects uh, for America's first public beach. And so we're very firmly of the belief that the money generated by parking meters at Revere Beach um, can and should be used to enhance uh, the jewel of the DCR park system. Uh, beyond the numerous ways that parking meter revenue uh, sharing uh, can improve Revere Beach, the basic details of a, of a parking program um, and the demand, uh, they demand uh, greater attention. Uh, staffing demands to monitor uh, and maintain a widespread parking meter pro program are absolutely monumental. 
And I say that because in, in Revere, we have uh, full-time staff, um, full-time enforcement officers, uh, and they manage our parking needs. And we only have 250 meters uh, that are city owned. And so by comparison, the boulevard alone will demand uh, staffing to manage over a thousand parking spaces. Uh, the seasonal and even the daily variations of parking demand along Revere Beach uh, certainly create uh, issues and challenges that will require careful consideration. I think you've heard this uh, through the, this public process uh, and certainly far more th thought than just setting up a bunch of meters. Uh, so please keep in mind uh, that the boulevard is also a short walk to two MBTA blue line stops, including um, the very popular Wonderland uh, T-Station. And so an influx of commuter parking on the boulevard which is currently addressed by the restricted parking hours during the morning uh, will need to be incorporated into any new plan. Uh, unlimited parking meters, uh, parking par uh, meter parking on the boulevard uh, will destroy the regulated system now in place that successfully um, frustrates uh, commuter parking uh, during the morning rush hour. Uh, Revere can support and will support a plan for parking meters on Revere Beach Boulevard and even on Ocean Ave, uh, but only as a partnership. Revere can and uh, we are willing uh, to play a vital role as a partner to DCR uh, in a deliberate and thoughtful plan that recognizes the many varied and uncommon circumstances of the land uh, that includes Revere Beach Boulevard. Uh, I will say this, it is not just a beach. Uh, Hundreds of taxpaying residents live along the two DCR roadways. Uh, we cannot condone any type of parking plan that ignores the residents' concerns. Uh, so what we're looking for and what I'm here to advocate for is a partnership. Um, and that's how we viewed the situation back in 2012. I was not mayor then, but I know that that's what, uh, I was a city councilor and I know that that's what, what the, the, the goal was back then when this was talked about. Um, and this is how we view the situation and how I view the situation as mayor um, today. Uh, Revere Beach Boulevard and potentially Ocean Ave can generate a lifeblood of revenue uh, that will make Revere Beach Reservation sparkle. Uh, any plan that lacks uh, careful consideration of the nature and the magnitude of Revere Beach, uh, any plan that lacks the unique situation of the beach and how it's enmeshed in the urban setting of the city of Revere, um, and any plan that lacks a comprehensive curb management program that accounts for seasonal changes and the wide range of parking demands on the boulevard will surely create greater problems than it seeks to address. Uh, and I know that's not, not what DCR wants and it's certainly not what the city wants. Um, and, and I believe that a plan uh, carefully considered with input and cooperation with the city, uh, with my office and with the staff here in the city of Revere uh, will produce a viable prototype that will uh, not only enhance Revere Beach, uh, not only provide tangible uh, benefits to DCR and to the city, uh, but it will assure that the, the businesses and the residents who proudly list Revere Beach Boulevard and the city of Revere uh, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, as their home, uh, that their uh, interests and, and uh, that we value their stake uh, in the future of Revere Beach. Uh, so with that, I, I know this will be um, the beginning of many conversations that we'll have about, about parking, and I look forward to, to truly being a partner in, uh, in this project. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks for hanging in. No problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, next, we have John Buxton. Go ahead, John. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I live in the Fenway. The Fenway is a mixture of a lot of very prominent institutions, including Berkeley and Simmons and Emmanuel and MFA and Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I believe the residents of Fenway have not been included in the planning of this. I'm sure you talked to Simmons University and they love parking meters. They w want people to be able to 
drive in, have a class, whatever else, um, have a meeting with administrators and drive out. We would much prefer as residents that they took the tea. There are so many tea stops within two or three blocks of all of these places that there is no reason for bringing more traffic into Boston and the parking meters will do that. I don't think that you are talking about putting in meters that were before free spots. I don't believe that that's true. I think you needed, as we've told you many times before from the city of Boston, to um, cooperate and coordinate with the resident associations. We have a Fenwick, Fenway Civic Association, I happen to be on the board, that um, represents, uh, that has as membership, a number, a uh, large number of Fenway residents. And we were not included in your planning process. That makes no sense for you as an agency or for us as a neighborhood. I would ask that you put a hold on this entire parking meter project and start again, wipe this proposal off the table, start again by coming to Revere, coming to Fenway and talking to the people who live here. I'm sure you have talked to Simmons. I'm sure you've talked to Emmanuel. I'm sure you've talked to Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts, but they are not the people who live here year round. They, people come and work there, people come and visit there, but they do not live here. And we are the people who do. Please wipe this proposal off the table for the time being as if it had not been done and come to the two or three neighborhoods and talk to us. We are volunteers. We, ha we talk frequently to our city uh, councilor. We talk frequently to our state representative. We talk frequently to our state senator. And we are a concurrent, uh, a, uh, um, we, we seek consensus here in the Fenway and we've lived here for a long time. Please don't ignore us any longer. The DCR has ignored us many times before. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Okay, next we have Marie Fukuda. Go ahead, Marie. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so thanks for having this. Um, I guess I wanna join everyone else in saying thanks for doing this and, and we do, there are so many of us who live among DCR properties that really recognize mm -hmm. the problems that the DCR is facing with funding. I do wanna say on record that I would, I'm asking for, a re I'm requesting reconsideration of the Fenway's inclusion in this parking program. Um, I agree with Brian, Clegg, Steve Wolf, and John Bookston's points that the Fenway has really been squeezed from every direction. I agree with Steve's statement that parking along the parkways increases traffic. And I agree with the mayor of Revere who says that there needs to be consideration of distinct communities that front these areas. Um, for the Fenway, the history of the parkways and parking around the fens was a state identified plan in the 1980s that reduced traffic, improved the residential character of the area, and established parking that was acknowledged that could become exclusively for residents. So it was, par it was created for residents in a neighborhood where parking is scarce. To me, to invite increasing use of turnover meter parking is really destructive to this intent. Um, in looking at the proposal, it looks as if there are 400 spaces and 40 meters proposed between the Fenway Park Drive and Charles Gate areas. That is 23% of all the spaces in the proposal for a community of over 40,000 people living in a 1.4 square mile area. Um, I guess other, I have a few other things to say, but this is also a historically landmark park for me, looking at the meter design, I could not conceive of how that those meters could fit the character of an Olmsted designed parkway. Um, I think regarding the 
parking model. I have deep concerns about the revenue and I have deep concerns about how it will be stewarded and enforced. We've had many problems in the Fenway um, with concerts and with ball game parking. So if you're talking about cutting off um, monitoring Saturday at 8 p.m., we have Saturday late night use, we have Sunday games and concert events, the Fens blank, all of these cultural resources with MFA visitors as an example. If you are not implementing any type of parking enforcement on Sundays, I see that as being a big problem. I also wanna say that the low rates of $1.25 are not a benefit to this community. Um, that will actually cause increased, increased traffic along our parkways and also um, increase the use of those parking spots that are largely used by gardeners and by residents and of the Fenway for people who are visiting for entertainment uses. Um, the most important thing I, I want to say is that visitors to the Back Bay Fens do not drive to the parks to use them. Our neighborhood has the lowest car ownership of any city neighborhood, and it's reflected in really low parking spaces within existing building footprints. So I guess that to me, that means that the existing parking is extremely valuable to residents who have no other option. Um, and I'll just close by saying, we really want the DCR to be able to care for its open space and parkways. I'm concerned at hearing that in my neighborhood where the DCR properties have needed for a long time investment and improvement that the notion of collecting these revenues through a model that to me appears to have flaws and then puts it into the state fund instead of investing back in these communities is really an affront to the impacted communities um, in this proposal. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. Okay, I'm gonna to go to some of the written questions. Uh, first question, what does non-punitive enforcement mean? Um, it basically means that we're not taking a ha heavy handed approach towards enforcement. While we will have um, enforcement officers um, throughout DCR um, properties, our goal is not to have a quota associated with the number of tickets or citations that they write. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I would prefer to see parking restriction coincide with the summer months. Why not Memorial Day to Labor Day? I would imagine that's for Revere with seasonal. Yeah, so the, uh, so the um, proposed dates for Revere are April 15th to October 15th. Um, so so that, would be, that would be the season um, at Revere. I missed it, what was the, what was the suggested? In, in the question. Memorial, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Yeah, I think it was more just that we, we had kind of settled on dates uh, just for it being cleaner or easier to communicate rather than having a date that floats. Um, and, uh, and based on the, the dates that we selected, it, it was basically to, to capture, say, uh, April vacation as well as uh, Columbus Day weekend, um, but then also give us time to, um, to shut down our operation for the, for the winter. Okay, uh, next question. Could you please show again the map of Park Drive where meters will be installed and describe the affected sections of the road? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Dolores, um, I, I'm, I, we'll take a stab at it, Mike, and uh, we'll uh, invite Dolores to speak if, she, if uh, you aren't able to answer her questions. I, I guess what are all the cross streets and and it's just on one side of the road, correct? Yeah, correct. So not on not on the green space side of the road. Uh, so just just along, except for up in this this area here, past the landmark center. Um, so this is the one area that would have meters on both sides. But then starting, is it uh, Peterborough, and uh, in, in coming along from from there forward. Did I did I state okay. that accurately, Hazel? Yes, that is correct. Okay, uh, Dolores, who asked that question, um, raise your hand if you want to speak and clarify. I have any more questions on that. Um, next question, are there any revenue projections on how much this could raise for DCR? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I, some of these same questions came up last night, and so uh, finance provided us with a little bit of information. Um, so that this proposal, just reading off what the answer that they sent, this proposal is estimated to generate uh, up to 4% of DCR's operating budget, or about 1.5% of the agency's overall budget, um, but roughly uh, between 4 and $5 million annually. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, can you say more about the work done in coordination with the municipalities to assess whether any of these corridors may be the site of future on street bus or bike infrastructure? I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that last bit? Uh, can, can you say more about the work done in coordination with municipalities to assess whether any of these corridors may be the site of future on street bus or bike infrastructure? So in downtown Boston, a lot of parking spaces have been lost right to bike lanes. So I think that's the question. Yeah, I, I think so. So DCR, I think has a intent of trying to create where possible uh, bike lanes and things like that. Honestly, I don't know that these particular parkways, just because of their uh, size and width, are uh, conducive to creating uh, creating those uh, bike lanes and, and um, you know smart streets and being able to to uh, accommodate the multiple uh, modes of transportation. I I can't speak to um, the meetings. I was not involved in any meetings with the municipalities. I know that a lot of the um, discussions with municipalities was about the parking programs that they run, uh, just kind of in our uh, gathering information on how to implement a program and, and the benefits and costs and all those types of things that, that go with the parking meter program. Okay, I'm gonna go back to a couple of raised hands here. Okay, we've got uh, Sarah Freeman. Sarah, go ahead. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I live in Jamaica Plain, which is not one of the uh, communities where the meters are proposed, but I'm uh, a strong fan of the historic parkways, and so I wanted to hear the proposal. Um, a few questions or comments. One, I don't want to stand in the way of DCR getting one penny. Um, so, but on the other hand, I can't help reacting as um, on the historic parkway versus a road, the slogan on the green book that I often quote, a parkway is not a road, it's a park with a road in it. And one thing I really like about DCR parkways is when you get there, you feel immediately that you're not in an urban city environment, or at least that's the ideal. So there's that aesthetic emotional reaction, but then maybe even more to the point, it seems like a trend that um, there's pressure on DCR to increase user fees um, to pay for programs that ideally would be paid for by tax dollars. And I know this isn't up to DCR, but if any state reps or staff are still listening, um, my preference would be for, I'd much rather pay higher taxes and not see meters when I get to a park. And not just for me, but uh, the equity issue and there's an Olmstead quote out there that if I find it, I'll submit it as a written comment that we have a duty to provide public access to natural spaces. And I think he said it in relation to Yosemite and these much bigger parks, but the idea that, that this is part of public responsibility. Um, and I think the last thing I wanted to say is the rangers, if I understood correctly, enforcement would be by rangers. And that made me sad because I feel like if DCR has 450,000 acres of parkland, I know I hear sometimes that 
uh, facilities aren't open as long as they used to be or they're understaffed and yet when I go to the state house I see lots of DCR rangers managing the the doorways or the security and I just feel like D when someone becomes a DCR ranger they might have an image of being out in nature educating visitors leading tours and I doubt if many of them see themselves as parking meter enforcers. I could be wrong, but I was just sorry to hear that. Um, and last, um, was glad to hear that if you do go through with this, that at least it would not be single space, but multi-space. So a little silver lining. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, next. We have uh, Dolores, I'm going to uh, probably mispronounce your name and I apologize, Bugdanian. Go ahead, Dolores. Thank you, Jennifer. You did a great job. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to underscore the things that I've been hearing from my neighbors. I live on Park Drive and, uh, and I think the comments that Sarah just made you know, really touched you know, the, the feelings that I've been having about about um, you know DCR and the wonderful resources that it has in its stewardship, and it hurt me to hear at the beginning of this presentation that the agency has been tasked with raising its own revenue in order to be self-sustaining. I think a, a park system, a public park system, shouldn't have to do that. Um, sort of corporatize itself in order to provide something that um, really doesn't doesn't have a, has a, is, is, falls outside something that relates only to monetary value. Um, also a little discouraged to hear that the Kennedy School of Government came up with this. I'm sure DCR's own staff might have better ideas about how to help the agency. Um, so um, I think my, the point I really want to make is that um, even in addition to the, the wonderful comments that have been made so far, I think putting a five foot tall, sleek looking um, parking meter um, on our residential streets does a disservice to the parkway and it also does a disservice to the surrounding neighborhood. It connotes commercial use. The proposed meters that are going to be on that small stretch of Park Drive in Audubon Circle, which is north of the um, train tracks, so I guess it's between the Riverside MBTA tracks and Beacon Street, that's my neighborhood. That's all residential buildings. And the impact it will have on the people who live in those buildings is as has been early described and um, is, it falls inordinately on, on them uh, to pay for this. It encourages, as others have said, movement of cars, which is never a good thing in a congested neighborhood. And um, the fact that institutions have been given access to parking spaces and residents have not, I think is a disparity that needs to be noted and accounted for. Um, the, um, the, the, the other thing is I think if you really don't want to um, um, impose a, a heavy restriction on residents, then if you go forward with this anywhere in, in all the parkways that have been described tonight, then the, the collection of money should stop before 8 p.m. Because if residents have to move, if they're going, if they're leaving the neighborhood to go to their jobs, when they come home, it's not going to be at 8 p.m. And they should have a place to park their car to go home and eat their dinner. So I think you should stop the collection of money well before 8 p.m., especially in areas where these meters are being put in, in, in front of residential buildings. So I'll be submitting written comments on behalf of the Neighborhood Association and look forward to hearing more. I'd love to hear more about a striped center line on Park Drive someday. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an unsafe road right now because there's no center line. And I don't understand why that's something that the agency can't do. Um, for public safety. Uh, thank you, Dolores. And you had asked a question in Q&A about the lighting. Do you want to um, address that here too? 
Yeah, I was just wondering, is it the key, I did, you know, it looks like the kiosk would be lit in order for people to operate them. I just wanted to know whether or not they'll remain lit or is it, is, do they go dark when they're not in use? So it just it sounds like, you know, if they're on all the time then there's a source of, of light, light pollution in the city, something, you know, we all should be cognizant of. Yeah, I, I can address that. The uh, meters uh, go into a, a sleep mode, if you will. So they, um, after the transaction is complete, after um, maybe 30 seconds or something, they do all the lights dim. When any of the buttons are touched, that's when it illuminates again. So somebody can, can uh, complete that transaction. But uh, again, uh, shortly after that, it will go dark again and will not cause any um, issues for any residents. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next, we have um, a city councilor from Revere, uh, John Powers. John, I don't know why um, the way you dialed in is different, but I have to promote you to panelists, which will mean you'll also be on camera. So, John, I think you can speak. You probably have to unmute yourself. Are you there, John? John? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I've got muted myself. Thank you very much. And I'll be uh, in the interest of very, uh, very brief. Uh, good evening. My name is John Powers. I'm a city councilor in the city of Revere in that capacity. I represent the residents on Revere Beach Boulevard from Revere Street to Cary Circle. Just recently, last Friday, as a matter of fact, I learned of the plan to install parking meters on Revere Beach Boulevard. I certainly hope that this is not a done deal. As you know, the boulevard has a major uh, route for traffic, uh, south in the morning, north in the evening. And this is a, uh, creates an inconvenience to the residents living on the west side of the boulevard for decades, where this has been a residential area, going back 60, 70, 80 years, okay? Many of the residents living there are senior citizens and require visits by medical professionals and others who look forward to visiting with their family members. These residents have paid their dues over the years. Further, I would recommend that the area uh, where the meters uh, may be installed, such as Ocean Avenue and uh, eastern, the eastern side of the boulevard, that that's where the meeting meters go and not on the western side of the boulevard where our residents live. Please also keep in mind that the Revere City Council, while we're on the subject of revenue, and I was a member of that council two years ago, uh, three years ago, maybe we voted $11.2 million to build that uh, maintenance uh, facility down there and also uh, the uh, toilet facilities. Okay, please keep this in mind that the Revere City Council uh, is always willing to work with DCR and, and, and that type of uh, relationship. And I think we've proven that. Okay, in closing, I would like to further uh, the discussions be held the, the, by the DCR elected officials and impacted mostly by residents uh, in future meetings. I hope this is not a done deal. I hope that the, uh, as the mayor said, that uh, we can all work together and, and work to uh, make this uh, a better a reservation and a uh, better uh, community. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank Powell. you, Mr. Powell. Okay. Uh, we just have a couple of uh, written questions now. Um, please detail your plans for continuing public input. In other words, will you be convening meetings with electeds and leaders or members of neighborhoods associations? How will you report back to us? Uh, I can probably answer this. Um, at this point, we're going to take all the input we've gotten over the last two nights and decide how to go forward. So I don't know that we have um, a plan to detail, but uh, stay tuned because we will post that um, as decisions are made. Um, and I think that's it. Are there any other questions? Okay, with that, um, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Mike, can you advance to the last slide again so that folks can see how they can provide input uh, on the plan? 
so for the next two weeks, uh, you are free to provide input, uh, input to the plan. Um, you can go to uh, DCR past public meetings. Uh, you will have a link there to submit public comment. Um, if you uh, prefer to email, you can email me directly at jennifer.norwood at mass.gov or email mass.parks at mass.gov. We do take uh, public comment through email as well. Um, please note the comments that you submit um, will be posted on the DCR website. We don't include your contact information, most notably email address and what we post on the website. That information is op uh, optional. We use that for future outreach on uh, projects like this. Um, hold on, I now have, it looks like a couple of hands have come up. Um, for a couple more questions, we've got about five more minutes. So let me see, Brian, uh, Clegg, you have another uh, question, go on. Uh, you just answered it, Jenny. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Okay. Um, and now I've got down here uh, uh, JS. Hi. You are unmuted. Yes, thanks. Uh, so I had a question about Star Drive. So the Esplanade is a DCR property. Is Star Drive considered affiliated with it because it's adjacent to? It, it, it's it's a parkway. Yes, Star Drive is a parkway. It's a DCR roadway. So Star Drive feeds into the entrance to the Mass Pike where tolls are collected. Is DCR receiving a portion of those Mass Pike tolls for traffic that is uh, coming from or going to Star Drive? I have no idea. I, that's something, um, Mike, do you have any idea? I, I don't, I don't think so, but I, I can't say that definitively. Is there a way that you could talk with Mass Pike um, to actually receive some of those funds to help with the DCR operating budget, given that there have got to be tens of thousands, if not more, vehicles that are going through that parkway every single day and where there's significant volume? Um, I don't know. Uh, we can certainly ask, um, but uh, parkways are not toll roads. And um, I, I don't think just because they intersect with MassDOT roads, we cross MassDOT and City of Boston roads all the time, toll roads and otherwise. Um, and I don't believe there's toll sharing, but certainly we can ask. That's actually a good question to enter into the public comment as well. Uh -huh. So is Park Drive considered a parkway? Yes. But not a toll road, even though you want to charge for parking? There's a, well, there's use and there's parking. I think there was a distinct, Mike, I'm correct, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, we do not collect tolls on any DCR parkways, but yeah, this is a, a new, the new parking program. So un, unrelated. Okay. I would definitely encourage whomever it is who, I don't know, liaises or collects all the revenue from the Mass Pike that runs adjacent to other DCR properties um, as a means of redirecting some of those funds in a more equitable manner versus just having something that's going to overly impact some of the neighborhoods. And um, if there's anything else that can be done from whoever creates the DCR budget to make it more uh, reflective of public funding versus public funding that's short and then sort of trying to set up like a lemonade stand or something to get some type of volatile income from uh, parking fees, especially given, um, I mean, even for Fenway, the amount of utilization just even with uh, the stadium is different right now versus what it'll likely be again in the future when there isn't the pandemic. And if these funds are going to potentially be used or if the idea is to support longer term projects, I would definitely um, say that that type of change, like that type of long lasting change should come from 
a, a, an overall supported budget from whoever is granting DCR funds. And even if it means not raising additional taxes, but reallocating where all of the other line item budgets are for all the larger departments within the state to move some of it over, some additional funds over to DCR, I think that may be um, a better approach long term versus trying to essentially create a public semi private partnership with in DCR um, to try and just grant more or raise more funds when you're short. Thank you. Um, we have one more hand raise um, and then we are up on the eight o'clock hour. Hold on. Um, I've got Julie uh, Damiano. Go ahead, Julie. I actually, I think that's Karen Monty Brodak, maybe, that I logged in through uh, my Karen. staff with Julia. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to just, um, I'm sorry that someone happens to, of course, be at my door right this second. Jeez Louise, but I'm, I'm buzzing them in. I'm ignoring security because I want to say something. Anyway, um, so I'm president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. I, I very much you know, appreciate the, the challenge here. And I don't, uh, I'm very, very sensitive to the community members and their parking need. Um, you know, every day I, I work, I often work in the Emerald Necklace Conservancy Visitor Center, the Back Bay Fend. Um, and what I, I generally see often in that area are people that park there uh, sometimes weeks on end. Um, and one thing that I wonder about is if so, I mean, a lot of people are able to live close to the park and walk to the park or have transportation access to the park. Um, and I, I don't, I, I know that the details of this proposal likely need some work, but I also think that there is potentially a value in, um, in the, in, in having some sort of, uh, having some sort of um, opportunity for, uh, for, for access, increased access, at least some amount of parking available over time for this area for people to come, perhaps with, with strollers, um, with bikes, um, excuse me, I'm thinking mainly of strollers or people that are handicapped. Right now, there isn't a lot of that type of space available and there isn't a lot of turnover. Um, I noticed this spring uh, when the COVID crisis first hit and all the students went home, that a tremendous number of the out-of-state plates and other people that were essentially storing their cars along a section of the fence that I was familiar with left. And, um, you know, some of those areas are neighborhood parking, but some of them aren't. And, um, and I feel like a lot of people are sort of exploiting it, particularly in front of the MFA. And, um, and, and sometimes those cars are there for a long time and garbage collects around them. And I do think there is a sense of the deadening of the park experience. There's not people coming in and out, going in and out of the park. Um, so I, I don't know that this proposal is a way to solve that issue that I'm bringing up, but I do think that there is some value to seeing more activity and um, more, um, more access and, and, and more, more liveliness. Um, and, and not essentially having a linear parking lot beside the parks, but instead at least having a little bit more turnover. So, um, but I, at the same time, I, I meaning, meaning uh, parking space is available over time. Um, but I also am very sensitive to the fact that I know a lot of community members have started to depend on this uh, for, their, for their parking. So I, I, and have not just started, but for a long time. So I'm, I'm sensitive to that, but I just wanted to mention my experience um, there around Charles Gate, particularly um, on Charles Gate East, um, there's a lot of, I don't know if this was mentioned earlier in the meeting, again, I was in another couple meetings tonight. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, drug dealing actually in the area right at Charles Gate. And I think there aren't a lot of eyes and ears on that. And if there was more parking turnover, there might be a little bit more eyes and ears on that situation and a little bit more activity as opposed to the cars now that sort of stay there the whole time. Um, but again, that's my two cents and, and I, I really appreciate, um, you know, these hearings and, and an opportunity to, to, to share thoughts. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. 
Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you all again for attending. Please, please feel um, uh, submit public comments. We actually do uh, value them greatly. Um, these meetings have been incredibly informative and we appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, thank you all and have a good night.